Regards, and welcome to Ryan Rambles You to Rest, the podcast where I talk at length about matters of nearly no urgent need, nor heavy impact on our daily lives, in the interest of helping you there, off to a more peaceful state. Welcome, friends, new and old to a modest episode of Ryan Rambles You to Rest, a sleep podcast. I would like to be completely transparent with you from the outset. One core goal for this channel is to deliver to you, the resters, the best possible experience as you are sauntering off to sleep. This is relatively simple as a podcast. However, on YouTube, the platform controls ads and ad placement until a channel joins the partner program. In our last visit, we talked temporarily about the upsides of this channel being eligible for the YouTube partner program once it clears 1,000 subscribers. And this, I believe, includes the ability to affect ad placement. In this regard, there is good news and bad news with the latest update to eligibility rules. The good news is that the threshold of subscribers has been lowered to 500. As we have joined together and surpassed 800, this is very good. However, a new criterion has been added which requires that at the time of application a new channel have also published at least three videos in the most recent 90-day period. As you know, I have been busy lately and this has been somewhat challenging to produce for you, dear Rester, at this frequency. Therefore, to this end and endeavor, I have recorded for the time being this modest bonus, and hopefully another shortly hereafter, episode to help clear the way for the three video requirement, once the eligibility rollout reaches this channel. In this episode, I will engage in an amiable amble, a brand new segment that could take us to any place or direction on a whim. Before we begin, I would like to recommend that you subscribe to this show on your podcast platform of choice or YouTube. For news and announcements, follow us on Instagram at Ryan Rambles Pod. Our soundtrack is by Disparition. Here we are at the trailhead of our mellow meander. Ahead lies the unknown. I am reminded of a famous tale of adventure, wherein one adventurer to another inquired, where do these stairs go? And in reply said the other, They go up. In an amiable amble, I begin with a thought, idea, or moment that comes to mind when I begin this segment, and then I let that take us wherever it may. In this sense, an amiable amble could be the purest form of Ryan Rambles You to Rest, a sleep podcast. It may resemble, at moments, any of our other regular rambling segments, or perhaps otherwise extend our journeys into new territory. 
For now, I thought it would be fine to begin with this thing that was on my door two months ago. You see, what's been going on in my neighborhood is some very substantial work on the sewer systems. And I would say that in the home that I live in now, the sewer systems have been something of a theme, a returning theme from time to time, and their quality and operation. We've had several reasons to have our upper lateral cleaned, or pumped out, not owing, in my belief, to anything unusual in our own particular consumption and flushing behaviors, mind you. But at the beginning of it all, we began with asking if the city could look into the problem. And they did, but subsequently decided that it was not their problem, and should be instead our problem such as it was for nine months, perhaps nine months or more. But then came this thing on my door, a thing that hangs on your door and informs you of what is happening. And what was happening was that the city had come around on the matter, and decided that it wasn't our upper lateral that was the problem, it was their lower lateral that was the problem. The lower lateral is the portion of the sewer drainage from the home that goes into the main city sewer in the middle of the road. So they marked it up with spray paint and such, and left this thing on the door. It's like a, uh, it's like a, got the little doorknob hole on it, and, uh, it's like, it would be like maybe you would get a to-go menu this way, dropped off, put on your door, or similar to a do not disturb sign. This one, though, is a bifold and has information on both sides of it. And I thought maybe you would like to hear about what's on both sides of it, because maybe you haven't received one of these before. Either because you don't live in a large city, or because you don't have horrifically bad plumbing. So, officially speaking, this is a sewer maintenance notice. Uh, as it states at the top, it's got a green banner, and then it says important. As such, this is important information that you should have. The important information lists the work order number, and the date, and the time, and the address, and has some room for additional notes. In this case, the note is that the public utility company is going to replace the lower lateral because of roots. Well, perhaps I should back up a minute. You see, from the original diagnosis at the beginning of this whole saga, it was believed that tree roots were part of the problem. In particular, we have a very large tree out front that sits right up against the street. And truthfully, we love our tree. We had a tree just outside our front window at the old home where this podcast originally started recording. And the tree, as such, therefore, is a feature that we care very much about having out front. And when we were first informed, nearly a year ago, that the tree's roots could be part of the problem, we were definitely worried that the tree would have to go. 
Now, the first city worker who came out and said it was not the city's problem did suggest it was Roots. However, several relatively frequent visits from private plumbers said that it was not the case. That it was, as they might have shrugged and said, just old plumbing. I know, that sounds like a bit of hogwash to me too. In any case, all this time later, it finally came around that the city would replace the lower lateral. I don't know what made them make that decision so spontaneously. We have our suspicions that perhaps neighbors were involved, but I'm not sure. The bottom has a, another green band and a logo that says San Francisco Water Power Sewer. And the logo has like a drop shape. And the drop is divided into three sort of slices. The top part is blue and has some bubbles, which would make it the water. And the middle has a lightning bolt through it, which would probably be power. And then the bottom is just two green stripes because... Well, it's probably not easy to come up with a sightly color code and icon for the premise of the sewer. And they just went with the green of the rest of the band here. The fine print says, Services of the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. SFPUC. Being the entity involved with this uh, bifold informational pamphlet. So we can maybe look in at a little bit more of it. I will try to keep this from being as dry as the previous readings we've had from different instruction manuals. Although I suspect for some of you that would be just about perfect. If your preference is towards the manual's reading, let me know. Perhaps I can make some special episodes of that variety. So the... Basically the first part of the pamphlet outlines the work that was done. This was, I think, I guess this is a sort of post report. It says SFPUC sewer operations crews responded and took the following action. And there are check boxes. The specific actions that they took were the following flushed the sewer lateral and washed down, deodorized, and disinfected the area. Well, that's very helpful. Then, in addition, video inspected the sewer lateral for defects. That was uh, all that they have checked there. It says video inspection footage will determine if a repair is necessary. I think they did in fact determine that the that it was necessary because the work was eventually um, done in I believe August, early August, and uh, you know they they had no parking signs up and down the street, not just in front of our home but all the way down to the corner, and. I thought, wow, they've really got to have a lot of equipment then. And the dates were like four days, and I just thought, my goodness, it takes a lot to replace a sewer lateral. Then on the day, I would say that the crew was relatively modest compared to the space requested. I have a going theory 
that part of the idea is that they reserve a lot of parking spaces because somebody's not going to listen. Somebody is bound to park their vehicle in the wrong place overnight when the crew is coming. And then furthermore, and I think this is also interesting, I think they reserved extra spaces for that reason and only needed about a third of it. And furthermore, and I think this is also interesting, is that the dates that they provided were about four days and they didn't show up on the first day. And they were actually extremely efficient on the day that they came. They did it in probably, I don't want to say half a day, but it seemed like two-thirds. They, they dove right in there, tore the cement apart outside, or the, the road, got in there, dug it out. I thought they were going to be down in that hole for a minute, but they were pretty quick. Now, I was working that day, but I, I checked back in every once in a while. And sure enough, sometime in the afternoon, they had that sucker filled back up and covered. And not to come back and do more, they were done. They were super efficient. So I think that the extra time that they had, they had a buffer, they had a day before and a couple days after, and maybe it's because they schedule a lot of these and they operate in maybe a certain area or just have a certain list of sewer projects to work on and they get to the ones as they can and they don't know when they're going to get there. That's what I think basically is what happens. But they were remarkably efficient, you know. Like I said, I thought it was going to be a multi-day effort, and instead it was just an afternoon. Well, they started in the morning, but it was pretty much just an afternoon. And they left their equipment overnight, but then they came and picked it up. We joked about borrowing the steamroller and driving it around a little bit, We didn't. So that was the thing that happened. That is the reason I have this bifold brochure with the hole in it for the door. The context for bringing this up is that what's been going on is a very extensive additional sewer operation that may or may not be connected. But interestingly, it began almost two blocks away uh, about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. And whatever they were doing with their biggest power tools was shaking our house a block away. We're sort of around the corner from it, so as the crow flies, maybe not that far from the actual operation at the next intersection over, but it was rattling the whole place. And then once they were done with rattling the whole place and doing that work down there, which took a little while, they moved over to our intersection at the beginning of the week at the beginning of the week this past week. And as I'm recording this, it's a Saturday. And they worked today. They did a half day. So they've done, I think, five and a half days now on this new project. And it's not just replacing a lower lateral from one home. It begins all the way at the main intersection and right around the crosswalk, like not in the middle of the intersection. And then they've been, uh, they started there, and they kind of began with this T-shaped pit in the ground, and they drove these, like, steel beams in. 
you know, I, I couldn't watch the entire process, but I watched, you know, bits and pieces. And they worked on the T-shaped part. And I think they might have filled some of it in, and they've had it a little bit covered up, but two days ago, I noticed that they actually broke out that road saw that they use, the big blade and the water that runs through it. And uh, they cut a rectangular swath, uh, making the T-shape longer from all the way down at the intersection and then stopping up at right in front of our place. And that made me think maybe these things were connected. And maybe it wasn't our tree that was the problem. Maybe there's just some not great plumbing in the area. And I'll tell you what, we blamed ourselves for a minute. Thinking, you know, maybe we needed better, more... Maybe we needed thinner toilet paper. You know, we're the monsters. And we changed brands from when we lived at the old place. Now, they haven't gotten all the way up here to the house yet, but it seems like they're fixing to do that, which means it's also kind of like luck that I'm able to record right now and talk to you. Dear Rester, I don't really want to dwell for too long on the topic of sewers and sewage. One of the things that I thought about while this was taking place, this original work, the recent work that I got this door thing for, was how little I understand or know about how sewers truly function. And I would say that on some levels I've probably doubled my knowledge over the last year because of these circumstances. But it did make me think about how long we've had the sewer technology, and the sewer technology is famously attributed to the Roman Empire. And the reason I bring that up is because there's been this funny conversation going around, and I suppose it's coming from somewhere on the internet, a TikToker perhaps, but it eventually made its way back to me as I was asked by some co-workers how often I think about the Roman Empire. And apparently it's a thing that supposedly it's disproportionately high for American men, maybe all men, I don't know, to think about the Roman Empire regularly. And when I was prompted with the question of how often I think about the Roman Empire, I remembered the sewer situation from last month. And then coincidentally, I had mentioned the Roman Empire very tangentially in using a movie quote in a Discord chat in my fantasy football league where I was having an exceptional weekend in fantasy football. I was getting the highest score in the league while my opponent was getting the lowest score. And I was reminded of the scene at the beginning of Lolita where Peter Sellers, draped in a sheet, is playing ping pong with James Mason, who is just holding a gun and not playing ping pong. And Peter Sellers says that he's really winning. 
And that was the, that's the short version of the quote that I used. But it's in the story, if you remember the film, he's, the, he says that they're playing Roman ping pong. That's the Roman part of the reference. So between September with the Roman ping pong and then August when the sewer work was done, I said that I had listened to, I said that I had thought about the Roman Empire at least twice in the last two months. And apparently it's kind of a thing to think about it more frequently than that. Some people it's more than once a day or once a day. Um, now, because it's become a little bit of a meme with our work folk, it probably now comes up every day, and I've been thinking about the Roman Empire um, every day and probably multiple times a day and, you know, somewhat involuntarily, I would say. But I wanted to share that in case any of you, dear resters, had been subject to the Roman Empire thought meme that seems to be going around. I've only heard it at work, but I assume that it's widespread. And in any case, if you have heard about this, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? Let me know. Now, as I said, I don't want to spend the whole time thinking only about sewers and, by extension, the Roman Empire. I thought it would be nice to tell you about an experience I had the other night. It's something myself and my partner have been talking about since it happened just the other night, which was we stepped out of our home for an evening. And a small while later, we were actually quite impressed by how much we had done in a small amount of time. I'm the type of person who, to be fair, generally speaking, inflates the amount of time I think it takes to do things, just to be on the safer side. And, in fact, I do find that a lot of things do self-inflate. One of the things that I think self-inflates the most is drive time when you're doing a road trip. I feel like just about every time that I look up the amount of time it's going to take to get from one place to another, it takes like twice as much time. And that's on a, like on a big trip, you know, not a drive from one side of town to the other in 20 minutes. It's usually about 20 minutes. But if I see that, you know, our drive from home to where we're camping is a three-hour drive, I assume that that's actually going to be a four-hour drive. We're probably going to stop somewhere to get a snack or a gas. And interestingly enough, stops that stops seem to add more time than you think they're going to add. Like, you know, we stop to run in to grab firewood, say, from a supermarket. And you think, you know, you pull off the road, you pull into the lot. You grab the firewood, you pay for it, you get back in the car. What is that, five minutes? But it seems to add, like, 
15, 20 minutes. It seems like the amount of time it adds is always disproportionately higher. And just in general, when I plan on doing things, I just think that the amount of time that anything is going to take tends to be longer than you think. I feel like something that we do psychologically, not just me, I think this is something that many people do, but I think when we think about how long something is going to take, we think it will go faster. And then when we think about how long something took, we think it went slower. And maybe that's, you know, based on specific things of like whether it was exciting or boring or, you know, strenuous or relaxing. Maybe those things, those feelings color that. And maybe this isn't, just isn't a very good generalization. But I think it's something like that. I watched part of a TED talk recently where the uh, woman who was presenting said that people who feel like they're overworked usually overestimate how many hours they've been working by something like 30%. So... The other night, my partner had an art piece at an art gallery. And it was in our general neighborhood area, somewhere that we could get to relatively easy. And we left our home on the later side at 7 p.m. And we went to the gallery. And it was crowded. And... It was art that depicted mostly the neighborhood that we live in, the broad neighborhood. The the neighborhood that we live in is actually pretty big. And the art was depicting some places that were super familiar, some places that were maybe emblematic, like images of the types of houses that you see everywhere. But we, we, we looked at, I feel like, almost everything that was in the gallery. And the gallery was crowded. And there were a lot of pieces of art. And they were all kinds of different mediums or maybe genres. Everything was hung on a wall. But there were paintings and photographs and other craft-type art. There were little sculptures, like somebody uh, sculpted buildings, little model buildings. Um, One of them was from a movie theater. That was a movie theater near our old apartment, which I thought was very cool. And there was also a painting of the movie theater by our current home, and that was cool. And my partner's art piece is also very cool. It's made out of lots of different types of fabric. It's almost sort of like mosaic-like in that way, and they bring all of this texture. And the image that she made was of this... Um, piece of the Farallon Islands. Um, We don't think that much about islands off the coasts of of the United States, I don't think, especially little ones. Um, And San Francisco has a series of islands called the Farallon Islands, and one of the larger um, islands in that set is visible on a clear day from uh, behind our home. Uh, And she made this piece representing it. And 
What I really love about it is that she, you know, is working with like reclaimed fabrics and it's got this kind of like almost stained glass type of quality to it, the way that it reads. Um, but if, if you know that that is what it's depicting, you know, this specific part of the Farallon Islands, and that's something that you are used to seeing as often as I am, it's like a, it's dead on. It looks, it looks like, it, it looks like that thing. And I think it's amazing. Um, and that, that was sort of what was cool about this art exhibit was that there were things like that. There were, um, pieces that, um, some of them were abstract, but they still kind of resonated because you live here. Uh, like there were images of houses and, and, you know, houses here aren't all exactly the same, but they have things things in common so you could look at any image and think it's emblematic or representative even if it's not like your home it reminds you and there was this one painting that we both thought was pretty fantastic it was a painting of a vanity mirror in a bathroom an old one that's embedded in the wall and it has an old-fashioned latch, and the latch is open, and the vanity mirror is slightly open. And to the left of the mirror in the painting, you can see tile, which is probably the shower. And to the right of the vanity mirror, you can see a roll of toilet paper. And we thought this was super charming because we have pretty much the exact same vanity mirror in our home with the extremely crappy latch on it that won't close. And so this slightly ajar vanity mirror painting really hit home for us. And ours is next to the shower. It is not next to the toilet paper, but it was close. And it was just one of those things of like, wow, there must be so many of these in this area. It's pretty incredible. And my partner joked that maybe, you know, somebody was in the business of selling extremely crappy latches for these cabinets. And they made a killing because they are in many homes. So we went to this gallery opening. It was an art walk night. Once a month we have an art walk night. And there are there were musicians on the street. Some out front. The gallery itself is next to a new uh, pasta store. It's almost like a pasta deli. Uh, all fresh pastas that are really good and they definitely make you want to um, buy them and eat them of course but also like think about making your own pasta they recently started having sit down dining and we haven't done it yet but we got the pasta from them a couple of times filled pasta and we did also one time get spaghetti from them and they were all really good. Spaghetti is a pasta I don't feel like I see very often for sale as a fresh pasta. Um, and if you have the opportunity, it's actually worth it just to have a chance to kind of compare and contrast the dry stuff. I've eaten the dry stuff my whole life, so it's not like I'm going to stop doing that, but it's definitely kind of good. Now, in any case, 
them to keep things slightly on track, and I feel like try to approach the completion of this story, and frankly, there's more. We didn't go into the pasta place, I just remembered that it was there. So we walked down the street, art walk night, Thursday night, and there was this Thursday night also our home sports ball 49ers were playing while we were out and you know it was the night game had been on for a few hours but we thought about um, popping into one of the uh, many bar type environments with food in the area to watch the end of the game and have something to eat and we walked many many blocks past several places and uh, didn't really want to stop at any of them but there were options and then my partner went into a store that was probably primarily clothing but kind of mercantile that had um, San Francisco and neighborhood themed merchandise and this is actually a popular type of store in San Francisco now I don't remember there being many of these when I first came here but now there is a lot of kind of both nostalgia for the city itself and a certain amount of neighborhood pride across the different neighborhoods so you can find tote bags and shirts and hats and cups and posters and all that kind of stuff that uh, represents your neighborhood there's a lot of kind of neighborhood pride which I think, interestingly enough, isn't especially competitive. It's just sort of there. Well, in this particular place, we purchased a t-shirt. And the t-shirt was a depiction of an old paper transfer from the mass transportation system that we used to have. We still have the mass transportation system, but we don't use the paper tickets anymore, the transfers. These were around maybe 20 years ago. Everything is electronic now. But it used to be that you paid your quarter or 50 cents or a dollar to ride the bus, and then you would get a paper transfer. And that paper transfer was good for X amount of time um, before you would have to pay again. And um, that's what was depicted on the t-shirt. Then, after we went to that mercantile thing, we went to a new, uh, relatively new, like the last year or two, um, brewery, pub type of place, and uh, there was about a quarter left of football and it was pretty noisy and we got a corner spot at the bar and we got some burgers cheeseburgers it was National Cheeseburger Day early in the week I'm giving you a lot of information about when this was actually recorded I don't know when it's going to go live, but, you know, you can kind of start to figure these things out. Um, so, had some cheeseburgers and fries, and they were garlic fries, in the style of our baseball ballpark fries here, which are very good. If you ever go to a Giants game, you should definitely, yeah, that's our baseball team, you should definitely get the garlic fries at the park. That's one of the main jams. So we had burgers and fries and watched the game. And then after that, 
we kept walking. And, you know, the game, I don't know how long we watched the game for. A quarter of football takes time. And then we walked from there, and we walked several blocks more, and stopped to pick up um, a few items that we needed for home from the pharmacy. Um, you know, our original plan was to just jump on a bus right away, but we kept walking. And then we walked further, and because it was still open for just another, like, two minutes, we went into our favorite ice cream shop and bought some chocolate ice cream because we were out. And after we walked out of there, we realized that the ice cream shop closed at 9 p.m. And we thought, how did we do all of these things in just two hours? We went to an art show. We went to a sports pub and had dinner. And we walked around the whole neighborhood. And we bought clothing at a store and ice cream at an ice cream shop. And some items at a pharmacy. And then we took a bus home, and all of it was in two hours. As you can tell from my tone of voice, I'm still somewhat in shock and impressed. And we'll probably on some levels continue thinking about this long into the future. For now, I feel like this might be a good time to stop with our first foray into an amiable amble on Ryan Rambles You to Rest, a sleep podcast. Do you have any stories about doing a lot of things in a short period of time? Perhaps that surprised you? Do you like going to art galleries, or eating cheeseburgers, or watching sports ball? Well, let me know in the comments, or on any of your favorite socials. And I think we'll leave it here for this episode. I hope you have been adequately rambled to rest and are not hearing what I am saying right now. However, if for some reason you are conscious at this time, I will leave you with these parting words. Cast, drain, toe, observant, polish, descriptive, imported, Bashful, hungry, and befitting. Thank you again. I am your host, Ryan. Our music has been by disparition. And I look forward to seeing you again in the next episode.